on the Edith Garland Dupre Library's YouTube channel and the AOC Community channel. We are so excited you guys are with us. I am Shaylin Woods, and I'm the head and archivist of the Ernest J. Gaines Center, which is located in the Edith Garland Dupre Library. I welcome you to this week's book discussion, hosted by the Edith Garland Dupre Library. Dupre Library has become an active and vibrant part of the community. We play a large role in disseminating the history and culture of our area, including topics that are current and critical for our community. Our library is rich in resources that support the research needs of all of our users. Book discussions, such as the one we're hosting tonight, are the next over the next several weeks are one more way we fully support the institutional and research programs of the university and provide access to information to our entire community. This is part of the Who Gets to Vote reading and book discussion series, which is funded by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. And through, through which is funded through the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, administered by the Federation for, for State Humanities Council and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The series was developed by LEH and is intended to engage members of the public in conversations on the history of voting in the United States. And we are happy to have two UL faculty members and scholars leading these book discussions. Tonight's discussion will be led by Dr. Pearson Cross. Dr. Pearson Cross is an Associate Dean for the College of Liberal Arts and an Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. His principal areas of teaching and research are state and local politics and Louisiana politics. He has published articles and book chapters on topics including redistricting, elections, white supremacy, Southern political culture, and the judiciary. He is nearing completion of a book about the education reform in Louisiana. And his other book, The Party is Over, Louisiana Politics in the 21st Century with Dr. Christine Malloy is under advanced contract with LSU Press. Dr. Cross has a weekly radio show called Bayou's to Beltway on KRBS, which is station 88.7 FM that focuses on politics and policy and is a frequent commentator on political issues for news media at the national, state, and local levels. Dr. Cross received his BA from San Francisco State University in 1985 and his PhD from Brandeis University in Massachusetts in 1997. So thank you all for joining us and please let's welcome Dr. Pearson Cross. Pearson? Okay, thank you for that uh, introduction, yes. That's good. Okay. Good job. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, you know, and I look forward to uh, our discussion, which I hope will be robust. And uh, at the outset, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. At the outset, I want to uh, make sure that uh, everyone is able to participate. Uh, this is not a lecture, this is a discussion. So, uh, hopefully, most of you have read most of this book or good sections of it. Uh, certainly, the issues that are involved in it are per persuasive in terms of things to think about and, and conjure on. So I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Um, I'm not going to lecture, but I'm, I'm just going to start off with a couple of key points uh, today that I thought were really interesting. And I just put these together a few minutes ago as I was thinking about what uh, we were going to talk about tonight and I was thinking man this is a great time to talk about voting and the history of voting uh, in America and I'm really glad that the book we're reading the embattled vote in America has uh, given us this opportunity and my thanks to uh, Tiffany and Shailen and everyone else who is working for the the grant with LEH to put this together and make it available thank you so much and um, let me not forget did you mention uh, AOC Shailen? Okay, good. So this is the, a little list I came up with, and maybe you have some other things. Well, for one thing, we've just come through an extraordinary election in the United States. It was a contested election. It was super close. Uh, as it turns out, had 42,921 votes gone to Trump in 
three states, we would have ended up with a tie in the Electoral College of 269 apiece, uh, which would have thrown the election into the House of Representatives. So uh, very, very tight election. Of course, the uh, general vote was not so tight. But uh, had that gone to the House, it would have been an even more historic election than it actually was. So uh, pretty crazy. And then we have an election where one of the major parties has made it quite clear that they often, many of them, I think some 74% is the figure I saw last, do not accept the uh, legitimacy of uh, Biden's victory. So really contentious issue here. Secondly, it was 56 years and three days ago that a group of protesters led by John Lewis and others marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, that resultant riot and the bloodshed led to the creation and passage of the Voting Rights Act, which has changed uh, voting and participation in America and really changed the outcome for voting for uh, people, particularly African-Americans all across the South, but also for other people in other communities and states. The Supreme Court, as we speak, is taking up voting rights in a couple of cases in Arizona that should be very interesting whether or not states are moving ahead on passing laws limiting rights to vote. Uh, state lawmakers have in fact introduced in 43 states have introduced 253 bills that would limit in some way the right of people to vote or access to the polls or different uh, restrictive amendments. By the way, 704 bills in the states have been introduced that would expand voting. So this is not a one-way kind of side. Uh, the House of Representatives on March 3rd, seven days ago, a week from a week ago, passed the HR1 for the People Act. That bill, if passed, would be the largest expansion of voting rights in the United States since the Voting Rights Act. And that was just a week ago. Uh, finally, uh, today in Florida, there was a ruling that said that that reduced uh, penalties for felons and allowed them to vote, uh, lifted the five year waiting period before they could participate and felons can now run for office after they have paid their fines and served their time. So a bit of liberalization there. Uh, there are 1.4 million uh, felons who have been denied the vote in Florida. And so some of those are closer to exercising their fundamental rights as of today. So it seems like to me that it's a really great time to start talking about voting and about uh, what, what we're doing in this country and why we're doing it and what we've done in the past and so on. So uh, let's start the discussion. Uh, how did you find, were you able to get into the book? Did you find the book persuasive? What was something that stood out to you about the book and first first impressions? Don't all speak at once. Um, I just I found it really interesting just how um, you know in the like at the beginning of the U.S. U.S. the U.S. history how African Americans you know they had the right to vote they lost it during the antebellum years. Mm -hmm. They regained it during uh, Reconstruction following the Civil War, but then they lost it to white supremacy during the Jim Crow eras. And then after the Jim Crow eras, you know, you have just like all these uh, voting restrictions that were, sorry, that were imposed on, um, you know, African Americans to, uh, you know, marginalize them and to, you know, just take away their voice and, and then that uh, progressively evolved into, you know, the voting wars via like proxy, um, you know, just uh, in, in you know, that's kind of what we have today. Just all these, um, the, you know, the increased partisanship between um, the Democratic and the Republican party and how it's, you know, it's getting um, more racially divided, sadly, and, um, uh just the polarization and the um lost my train of thought 
<laughs> just uh, well, uh, Michael, if I can jump in here, uh, you pointed to something that I think surprised a lot of people, and that was that it doesn't seem like the uh, the expansion of voting isn't this un isn't this clear narrative. You know, I think I think a lot of us had figured that okay, we knew in the beginning that not very many people could vote, but then we assumed that there was this gradual expansion and people became enlightened and then voting got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, as you say, not in fact the case, right? Right. There were steps forward, there were steps back. What struck me was that in, um, there is so much discussion all the time in news with people about rights and about what our rights are and how the constitution outlines those rights and the very basic fundamental of how we make decisions in this country about voting is not actually a right. And I consider myself fairly educated, but that somehow either I had forgotten that or it had not really registered to me that that is not fundamental and not built in. Yeah. I, I would concur with Vicki. That, that struck me too, and in, in someone who has prided himself as a history major at one point in time and as a political you know, junkie all the time, I thought for sure I, I had that one nailed and, and, and didn't. I thought that the author did a good job of coming back to that on a number of occasions that we think in terms of the, the, the negative rather than the affirmative when it comes to the, the right to vote. Um, yeah. For me, this book raised a lot of questions. And one of the questions that I had is, who is Lickman's audience? Um, who is he writing this book for? Um, because it seems to me some of the things that people are surprised about in various communities and communities of color, we've known these things for quite some time. Um, in the communities that were marginalized and that were um, disenfranchised, um, this is not anything new. So as I was reading this, I was wondering who is his audience? Um, who is he? Um, who's his message for? Did anyone else, uh, following up on Vanessa's comment, did anyone else feel that this is written for a specific audience or aimed or targeted a particular way? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, if not written for uh, a specific audience, it's definitely very helpful for a specific audience, um, you know, and like, and specifically like white people and people who haven't really been disenfranchised throughout the, the, the history of the United States or more specifically the recent history, because I mean, non-property owning uh, white men were discriminated against at one point, but it's not like that's still in our collective memory. It, we're not still feeling the effects of that today. Um, but it, it kind of building off of that, it reminds me of, you know, there's the, there's the, the, the adage that history repeats itself, but then there's <laughs> another adage that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And <laughs> there is a lot of that within this book that really drew me in about the, the different arguments that were used for not letting, you know, women vote are still used today in other areas that women are fighting for uh, more equality. Same thing with people of color like all these same arguments have always just carried through over this years. And even though they've never like worked for like, they've never worked fully. It's all, they've always been overcome. They're still being used to stop progress. Yeah, I think that's good. I was struck by the kind of uh, echo of the things that royalists now, we talk about fraud and we talk about stolen votes and we talk about who's qualified to vote. And we talk about personal characteristics of people who may or may not vote. And we worry about things. And it goes all the way back to the founding. I mean, those same concerns about which citizens, who's gonna vote, how are we gonna make sure, are they really qualified? Uh, it's really, that part was really interesting. It was, you know, did anybody else see that? This kind of back? This yeah, like, back I saw how he was like, he would bring up a topic of like voter fraud and then he'd poke holes in it. And it was good to see how he did that, like saying that it might be because the machines are old or it might be that people aren't trained and that that's coming up in Congress. And he, I loved how he put Congress in there. He put that Congress has a big role to play in this too. And it's time for Congress, Congress, Congress. And I thought it was, he did it in a way that made me understand where it came from 
and why it's a problem and how it can be fixed. And that's one of the things I mainly liked about the book. I think everybody needs to read it. It was amazing. Even like just to listen to it, understand more, like, like Dustin said, the pattern and the history and the, and the everything. <laughs> it's just crazy to see how it all added up. Interesting. Okay, good. So let's let's tackle the founders a little bit. Uh, do we are they a little tarnished after this? I mean, what were the founders thinking? Why did they not protect the right to vote early on? I mean, it's not in the Constitution. It's kind of given to the states. It's not a positive right. So what were they thinking? How how would things how? This is this is another question that came up for me about the founders. So I, my question was, is how did the founders address the inconsistency between their behavior and the philosophical ideas of the enlightenment that they claimed influenced them? So you had um, these founders that were citing enlightenment philosophers about agency and um, liberty and protecting um, and, and recognizing people's right for autonomy. And then they said, okay, but that's for us, but that's not for you. So they were violating some of the major um, philosophical ideas of their day. And there was glaring inconsistencies there. So for me, what began to emerge was this strategy um, of maintaining privilege and maintaining advantage. And so they employed mechanisms that made sure that they were gonna maintain their advantage. So it's ironic that they were trying to break free from an aristocracy, but essentially they replicated the aristocracy with the merchant class being the feudal lords um, in the United States. And yet that, that, that seemed to be a blind spot um, for them. And it didn't seem like anybody called them on it. Well, was it a Go ahead, sorry. I was about to say, was it a blind spot or was it hubris? It was them assuming this is what we believe, but we're educated and intelligent enough to believe this. So we need to protect it from those people who don't have the education to follow and understand. Yeah, Vicki, I was gonna ask, so how did the, how did the founders justify uh, their exclusion of everybody who was not white, male, and property? How, what what, what was their fundamental me, argument? It seemed to me that what they did, which is a common strategy of among elite people, is they either dehumanized them or infrahumanized them. So mm -hmm. the people they were excluding were never fully, completely as human as they are. And so they were not entitled, they were not perceived as independent moral agents um, with as much agency or entitlement to that freedom yeah. as they were. Um, and I definitely saw aspects of infrahumanization and, in, you know, basically making the other groups children or um, basically making them uh, less, not quite as fully realized, fully human as they are. Um, in terms of intellect. They were human, but not quite um, getting the full membership that they got to that. And so that, uh, that got them out. With their own enlightenment thinking, they could say, okay, well, they're not a fully independent, free thinking moral agent, and therefore they're not autonomous. Yeah, I think your last comment really hit it on the head. So one of the main argument is that for the founders, isn't it that you have to have autonomy in order to cast a disinterested vote or a disinterested ballot. And if you owe your existence to anybody, then you are not truly free, right? What do you think of that argument? It's convenient. Convenient, that's the word I was thinking, yeah. It, it also seems that, so they the founders obviously saw themselves as um, at least worthy or intelligent enough to nation build. To, to, to build this government. And so if you already have that sense of self about yourself, then it seems to, your, to that person, it would seem only correct that you should build a government that you would think would put you in charge. And so if you're sitting there and contemplating who do we give the, the votes to, well, it should obviously be people who would put us in charge. And you would think that like, oh, well, should we give it to, you know, people who we are enslaving? Do you think that they would ever elect us to office? Probably not. I completely agree with what Dustin said and what I got from it. It felt like 
they were trying so hard to grasp at power and to stay in power. And yet them talking about building this nation um, that's going to last, they weren't even, it didn't even seem like they were thinking about how their actions were going to play out a hundred years from now. Yeah. And go ahead, Jenny. No, I was just going to say, I think it, 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 it the, the author, you know, implied or didn't apply. He, he, he reminded us of the, the golden rule of politics. And that is that those with the gold rule. And I, and I think that there's a little bit of that in this. I think that, that that ultimately it is about power and it is about maintaining and keeping power and, and being reelected. And although there was, I think, obviously the the intent to try to be enlightened and do these other things. And, and, I, and, I, and I really respect Vanessa's observations and the way that they were able to prevent others from, from feeling like they should be a part. But um, I, I really think it has, you know, the, the, the basic roots of all politics in, 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 this, con, in this concept. Um, it's interesting, uh, Camille's comment about they, they weren't thinking about what happened in the future. I think they were. I think they set up a system in place to make sure that not only they would stay in power, but generations of their progeny would stay in power and hold power and create an, an infrastructure that would ensure that that would almost absolutely happen. I mean, their descendants would have to be complete and utterly hopeless morons um, the way that they set up with an advantage for them not to maintain um, their influence. Um, there's so many ways, in, and I guess I, I'm overstating it, but there's such a safety net where they could fail, but still um, maintain their status. Um, and, and I think that was thought out. I think they thought very carefully about that. And, then, and I think it was a strategy. One thing that I was really struck by as I read was that so much of what we think about in terms of voting doesn't happen at the federal level. I mean, so it happens at the state level. So the feds, one of the things that struck me was that states could have all of these onerous conditions for voting or for office holding or for everything else, but none of that shows up in the constitution. In the constitution, it's just, you know, age citizenship, you know, very straightforwardly, right? So uh, it's really the states where the action is at. And of course, one of the things about the states is they have all these different practices, right? So when you talk about voting, particularly in the early republic, but even today, uh, every state is a different mix, aren't they? So it's there's a real, uh, were you struck by the variety of different rules and different schemes for voting and all that? Yeah, I've never guessed I've really thought about it, um, but I was really struck by how different it is. And then I was thinking like, okay, now if I needed to know something, I can go online and Google and find out what I need, what documentation is what I need, where would I go? But they don't have that. So if you're changing the rules all the time, the only people that would be aware of that would be the in crowd or the ones in the know, which goes back to Vanessa's point. Um, and then it kind of also got me thinking about, um, also going back to uh, Vanessa's point, the intentional plot to keep it this way. So the three fist rule, we want you to count, but only for us and not when it can go against us. The, and then towards the end of the book, when he talks about the current uh, gerrymandering and the current how the Republican party may not want more people of color to vote, they're okay with only 50, 60% turnout, you know? It, and so it's all very um, strategic and I guess I've never realized that, but it's been strategic since the beginning. Yeah, excellent point, Kayla. Mm -hmm. I think the, just the voting not being at the federal level and just having all these inconsistencies with the states, like it reminded me and it reminds, reminded all of us just how nonlinear the struggle for suffrage really was because it's like, you go back to the early days of the Republic, some minorities could vote, some women in some states could vote, but then it went back and it changed frequently and it created such discrepancy on a, on a national scale that, um, you know, sadly led the people in charge to take advantage of the system through redistricting and gerrymandering. And that's what we see a lot of today too. 
That was one of the most surprising things to me was that uh, women, if you had property in some states, were allowed to vote in the very early days, you know, because you you had demonstrated that you had autonomy, right? Because you had the, the property. As we get to the 19th century, uh, and I'm moving on kind of to chapter two, if you're keeping track of where we're going, uh, we start to see a, a move, a move away from voting based on uh, economic ability. So you start to see uh, generalized uh, white voting, white male voting. And this is the era, of course, of Andrew Jackson, where the suffrage gets really spread out and you start to get the first mass-based parties. But at that point, uh, the justification for voting moves away from the uh, economic aspect of citizenship to a different aspect. And that's the intrinsic aspect, right? Who are these people? Uh, what are their intrinsic qualities? Are they women? Are they black? Are they, uh, are they Irish? Are they capable of doing that? And I thought it was really interesting that as those things came to the fore, that black voting, which had existed previously in a number of states by 1860 had really diminished all across the United States. So you have this movement where white voting expands, but black voting, minority voting starts to really drop off and, and be made illegal. I think only five states all in New England allowed black voting in 1860. And that even with property and everything. So I guess the question I'm asking you is, what's that counterpoint there that whites somehow get advantaged in this system, but all other factors regarding voting are, are taken as, uh, so blacks are put in a different category and Indians are put in a different category and women are put in a different category. So, you know, promotion for white men seems to be the, uh, the word of the day. Well, I was kind of struck by that. We're still dealing with the fact that the Republic, from what I'm understanding, my reading of it, is still very young and that the um, agreement between the states is still very tenuous. And so I think that um, disenfranchising these groups was in the best interest of the very powerful who had an interest in keeping the union together. So basically for the Southern states, they had to compromise and say, okay, so we're gonna disenfranchise these folks because if we don't, then we could be hurt financially um, uh, because we no longer have a decent relationship with you. Whereas in the states where they allowed some women's suffrage, um, I think it was in their economic advantage to do so. Those were sparsely populated states, um, mm -hmm. states where the women were not, women with property were not of a critical mass to, um, to shake up the power structure. However, um, Native Americans, the indigenous people, African Americans, um, they would be at a critical mass. Um, when I find it very interesting though, is that the very argument that they're using saying that these folks lack autonomy is the very autonomy that they sought to stamp out. So if they truly lacked autonomy, why not let them vote? I mean, after all, aren't they your puppets? Can't you just pull their puppet strings? So we really see um, just how um, disingenuous that whole reasoning was about one not believing that these folks could be fully autonomous because if that was the case, why not manipulate them? That whole kind of gaslighting that goes on with, oh, well, we're trying to protect you know, the integrity of the vote. We're trying to make sure that it's not you know, fraudulent. But at the same time, we're denying these people vote because we don't want them to exercise their autonomy. So I think that to your question, um, it was the, the desire, the strategy of the people who wanted the whole country to be unified to make these compromises and giving states, com and giving states sovereignty um, was a way to do that. And they felt that it was in their best interest to give suffrage, expand suffrage to white men over the other groups. They felt that maybe there'd be more of an affinity and that um, it would also do a good job of kind of suppressing these other folks that could be problematic. Okay, thanks. So, 
something about the um there was the argument over and over again that allowing women to vote or allowing African Americans to vote, they don't have that autonomy, and thus that they could be easily corrupted or or their their vote could be bought. But if you just examine that argument for more than two seconds, what you're saying is that there are white men out there prepared to corrupt and prepared to buy votes, but they're still allowed to vote, even though the entire basis of your argument is that you don't want corrupted people to vote. So it just, it's flipping the argument back on its head, but they don't, you know, they're not seeing that irony. And if they do see it, that's the whole point. You're not supposed to see it. And it's just supposed to strengthen their argument. Well, I think one thing when we think about this, we need to remember now there've been a few modifications that came along to the system that the founders put up. Uh, Probably one of them would be the uh, emergence of parties. So when you got people joining parties and voting or being members of certain parties, it started to overturn a whole bunch of things because it undercut the the model of the disinterested citizen picking a, a candidate, you know, So right away, you have to get the 12th Amendment to sort out the uh, vice president president thing because that no longer works. Uh, You know, so there's a move towards kind of direct election, mass parties, people running on platforms. And it's so a lot of the virtue that I think the founders envisioned in their idealistic 18th century view kind of washed out Uh, and it becomes more about naked self-interest. And then as Remember in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, leading up to the Civil War, there's an enormous surge of immigrants into the country. And there are all kinds of fears about, you know, so if you're an Irish person fresh off the boat, are you qualified to vote? You know, uh, can the can the machines in the big urban cities sign you up? And so we really see that sense in the mid middle of the 19th century of corruption existing in those big cities and we start to get some of the things that are still with us today. We also start to get gerrymandering, you know, 1812, uh, Elbridge Jerry, did you follow that? Uh, You may have thought gerrymandering was something that uh, political consultants thought up just in the last 20 years, but uh, it's been, a, it's been around a long time. Although I have to say, you know, with modern technology, gerrymandering is really uh, pretty amazing today. Uh, well, let's talk about the uh, Civil War. Dr. Pearson, and, to, yeah. to, to that point of gerrymandering, the, I was struck and I thought it was a couple of different times when it was pointed out. And I think, again, a realization that gerrymandering allows the those being elected to choose their voters rather than the voters choosing those to be elected. And the clarity of that statement really hit home. It was like, whoa, that's exactly what happens. And again, it's a simple truth, but I think one that, you know, we probably need to elevate more in terms of just using the term gerrymander. Uh, is everybody familiar with the concept of gerrymandering? How that works and everything. Uh, typically, uh, it's incumbent protection. Most states have their legislatures create districts for all their uh, elective offices. And oftentimes, the people creating those districts are the people who are going to be running in those districts. And so they try to create those districts in ways that would be advantageous to their party or their constituency. And they try to pack or crack. Uh, If they're voters that aren't going to be good for their party, they try to stuff them into a district or they try to spread them out over districts. So it's kind of corruption at the governmental level aimed down at voters. Uh, By the way, that's in the new uh, HR1 bill that just passed the House, the idea of taking away Uh, redistricting from legislators and turning it over to bipartisan commissions. So, but that, the chances of that getting through the Senate are probably pretty slim. So I wouldn't, if you're counting on that to save you, I don't think it's going to do it. Dr. Pearson, I think that uh, again, following up on the the gerrymander concept, I think it's, you know, it, it it has so many um, uh, 
I guess, intended consequences, quite frankly, the, the disenfranchisement in terms of lack of competition, um, the, the resulting influence of, of lobbyists. Um, yeah. there, there are so many things that, uh, again, I think the, the general public, myself included at times, dismiss and aren't realizing the, the, the consequences. So I was appreciative that the author continued to elevate this, this concept. Um, aside from, you know, separating uh, persons and, and, and all living alike and not uh, being forced to, to converse and have uh, conversations with those that maybe don't look and think like us uh, all the time uh, has, has other consequences. So I just want to, just as a quick fun fact, um, if you're looking for something that does a really good job explaining gerrymandering on like um, a, a really accessible level. There is an episode about of Adam ruins everything that does. It's a very visual episode that shows the gerrymandering. So if you're interested in sharing this with other family members and friends or linking it on social media, there is that episode that really does an amazing job explaining how gerrymandering started and it's actually its only function. Um, so just a quick fun fact. You know, uh, gerrymandering is actually a good model for, uh, uh, it brings up a lot of the issues in American politics because we all believe that we're individuals and we should all be treated as individuals, right? But what we notice is that although we're all individuals, people tend to vote uh, along racial lines. And right now the, the African-Americans in the United States are almost 100%, about 80 to 90% democratic. And as a result, uh, it's easy to gerrymander uh, on the basis of party. But what happens is if you don't gerrymander, and we've seen this in Louisiana and other places, if you treat everything as an at-large district in a state like Louisiana with 32% African-Americans, you don't get any African-American elected representatives. So if everybody in Louisiana counted off, you know, we have six congressional districts. If everybody said, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, and so we didn't pay any attention to where anybody lives. The chances are very good that we would not elect any African-American representatives to Congress and the same thing on the legislative level. So in some sense, gerrymandering, although we don't like it, and in fact creates opportunities for people by treating them as not individuals, but as members of a group, but it doesn't seem to be, uh, it really runs into some other concepts. It just shows how a problematic our electoral system is, election system is right now. By the way, I love redistricting and all that. And, and this is coming up this year. So if you were paying attention to redistricting, uh, the legislature is gonna tackle it in a special session later this year. And it should be very, very interesting. Um, so following the, uh, Following the Civil War, of course, we got the passage of three amendments, right? We got the 13th Amendment, freeing the slaves, the 14th Amendment, which has uh, some really explosive sections, section two, uh, and we have the 15th Amendment, which creates a positive right to vote. So uh, it, well, it creates a right to vote for African-Americans, right? And it creates a penalty against uh, states, the 14th Amendment creates a penalty against states who discriminate against African American males in terms of voting. But again, it doesn't go far enough to provide a, um, a, full, a full voting right um, to African Americans. And so African Americans enter a golden age of voting, right? Uh, so the area the, from 19, uh, 1868 to about 1877, there are lots of African-American officials elected across the South. Uh, there are lots of African-American voters registered. Uh, and in fact, many Confederates are disenfranchised. Um, so there's a real sense there that uh, African-American males at least are on their way. Did anybody find anything uh, super interesting about this part you wanna talk about? Well, I think it's interesting to note, and I think it'll be relevant in the later discussion of the later chapters, that African Americans um, were decidedly Republican. Um, they um, were uh, 
uh, and then the South was Democrat. Um, I, I think that's very important as the narrative goes forward and we look at issues of gerrymandering and we look at these other issues, I think it's important to remember that context because what was shocking to me across the entire book, um, particularly in the later years, I think this will become more relevant, is how the Republicans decided to disenfranchise rather than to, um, to modify their platform to try to appeal to these voters. Um, th so the phrase that really has um, that reflected on is the motto of the Congressional Black Caucus, which I think is, um, is very important in this context because I hear you know, Blacks being necessarily associated with just Democrats. Um, but the Congressional Black Caucus has the motto, Black people have no permanent friends, no, uh, no enemies, just permanent interests. And I think that has been consistent with history when it was in black people's interest and those platforms represented their rights and their platforms advocated for them, they voted for that party. And when that evolved, they voted for another party. So what's striking to me is that we all know that this history is pretty well known is why the Republican party has been so hesitant to modify their platform to better um, have outreach to these other groups if they are in fact believing just in capitalism that the best idea should win or a meritocracy. If that's the case and disenfranchisement is off the table, what should be on the table is improving your platform so that the ideas can be competitive and can appeal to that base instead of um, excluding them from voting. So I found that to be, a, I was, that I found to be kind of um, disappointing but um, also um, just an interesting observation I made um, going through that. I Anyone think, else? Go ahead. I was, well, was going to point out to what Vanessa was saying is interesting enough, enough four years ago, that's exactly what the Republican Party tried to lean in on. All of a sudden bringing back up the fact that they are the, they are the party of Lincoln and they are the party that freed the slaves. And to the Black caucuses point, it didn't really work because that doesn't matter. Like party lines don't matter. Party lines, it's, if you're looking through at the civil rights movement and basically the 1930s onward through the 70s when you have Black Power and you had the Black Panther, uh, the Black Panther stamp on this on the cards. The cards were not about a party; they were about interests. And the, those those voting cards were telling people these are the people whose platforms align with the interests that you need to be alive in this country and nothing to really to do just so happened when the parties flipped most of those people became democrats but it didn't actually have anything to do with the parties themselves it was who's gonna make sure it's not okay to kill us who's gonna make sure our kids don't you know don't are, are not essentially in accosted by officials because there's another word I was going to use but that's going to get misconstrued so I'm going to say accosted because their teeth aren't clean or their clothes aren't clean or they smell funny who's going to care that they're actually getting an education because that's what really matters it's more about show me what you mean show me your actions don't tell me what you're going to do and four years ago when they started leaning into that all of a sudden everybody was like and what's your point um so that is a huge difference we're looking at like cultural groups and what motivates them. And it's not, it's not always strictly about party lines. If the party line shifts, so does our loyalty. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Uh, there are a couple points here. One is that it's easy to read this book as a diatribe against Republicans, particularly in the modern era. But I think, you know, if we take it historically, it appears like the 19th century was the era when Democrats seemed to be mostly against expanding rights and expanding voting. 20th century, it was mixed. And as we move towards the end of the 20th century and the 21st century, the Republican Party is the party that's uh, playing defense on the expansion of rights. The second point is that, you know, minority groups like African Americans are not people upon whom things are done or done to or acted on, but Black Americans have agency. 
Uh, you know, if anybody thinks the Voting Rights Act would have been passed without the voting, without the civil rights movement and without all those marchers, they're crazy. So, you know, uh, people have, you know, acted in ways that change the, the game for, uh, for everybody, frankly. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. That's not. And I think that's what's happening. You know, um, I think the Latino communities and the other communities that are put in monoliths and, you know, they try to talk in generalities. I think that's also an issue for both parties. Um, yeah. So um, this seems to be a conversation really among the same elite group that the founders are and they're having this conversation. They're trying different strategies. Um, so it's interesting that one party's strategy is to develop a platform that seems to address the interests of other groups. And another party's um, strategy, as outlined by Lickman, is to just um, try to find ways to um, dampen influence. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that maybe has flip-flopped over history. I mean, history is a long journey, so... But at that moment, the moment that Lickman's um, documenting, that seems to be the case. Yeah, that, that kind of reminds me, and obviously this is a very blatant point made throughout the book, um, but kind of going back to when we were talking about chapter two, it's interesting, and I noted it, how many times they talk about defining what white is versus non-white and how relevant that is today. Like, I felt like I was reading about right now in this past election, and it was actually in, you know, 1840 um and then also like how relevant um moving on like how there's a quote that I have in here about um that white terrorists um would have no retribution if they intimidated black voters etc cetera, etc cetera, and how relevant that still is and it just feels like so have we really made any progress with voting or with rights and he kind of sums it up in the last chapter and in the summary like we've done some things but in other areas we failed but it's just crazy how relevant so much of this still is and that we've seen in the last you know year yeah i can't agree with you more that's as i read this book I, it just continually struck me about how the same things over and over slightly recast change sides but it's it's like this continual continual thing. Uh, you know what ended the, uh, the reconstruction, of course, and what ended black voting in the South was the Hayes, Tilden Hayes election of 1877, 76, 77. And in that, this may sound really uh, familiar, there were electoral votes that were disputed from states, uh, Louisiana and Florida. And then those states uh, Congress put it together to award those electoral votes. They all got awarded to Rutherford B. Hayes, who at the time was called Rutherford Fraud B. Hayes. So, uh, and they awarded the uh, Republicans in that case the presidency. And that was the deal that the, the Democratic South cut. They said, okay, you can be president, but you give us back the South and end Reconstruction. And so the, uh, in order to gain power, the Republicans cut the South loose, said, fine, we don't care about black voting rights anymore. You can do whatever you want down there. We're tired, we're moving on. And then you enter that period of starting to get Jim Crow, right? With this mass terrorism across the entire South. So it's pretty, it's pretty cold blooded, frankly, it really is. But I don't know, maybe it says something about self-interest and how much people are willing to bleed for someone else. I think what's really prevalent is just the re repetition of history. You have, you know, the, the yeah, amendments that, you know, constitutionally protected African Americans, uh, you know, with their rights and their ability to um, partake in suffrage. But then you just have all these restrictions that bypass, you know, any like any constitutional amendments. And we see that today. We see, it's like, you know, they come up with a reason to keep, marger uh, keep marginalizing certain uh, minorities. You know, wh whether we saw it with the grandfather clause, the literacy tests, 
just all these things to, you know, diminish voter turnout because they, you know, they had it pretty established from the beginning that you, when you minimize, you know, a voter turnout, you basically get to keep the same elites in power or basically sway elections in the way you want. And from like the 1800s to today, that is still very prevalent. Um, and that's what like throughout the book, we see that, you know, and even in the last chapter, when they talked about the Bush election and the, you know, the discrepancies in Florida with the voting machines, you know, it was just another, yet another example of how, um, just another example of how to restrict, uh, you know, the outcome of certain elections and, you know, um, the, tur the voter turnout. So I thought that was really interesting and just a prevalent point throughout the entire book. That's good. Someone else? Well, I've, I made a note to myself because the one thing that um, when we talked about themes throughout the book, I, I narrowed it down to like just some very basic phrases. We have the, the tactics like gerrymandering that has always occurred and we can still doing them. We have claims of fraud. I made a notes of that from the very first elections. There were claims of fraud. Oh, people are doing it. And then we always have the issue of class distinctions. We've changed what those distinctions are. But every time we've added amendment or changed laws, we just create new ways of classifying groups of people in a way so that some people can be better than or more than the others. And that's how we limit their votes. And it really over and over comes down to those three things and it never stops. So is trying to limit the vote and deny some people their right to vote as American as apple pie somehow? Um, to a certain extent. That seems, no. um, I was gonna say that the, the, the way you phrased that brought something is like one of my first notes that I made about this is all the way back in the introduction, uh, it, it, the United States is described as the world's oldest surviving democracy. But it's like when you read the entire book and our entire history is denying people the vote. So when do we become a democracy? When are like, at what point can you classify us as a democracy if our entire history is, well, who can we keep from voting? And how is that politically expedient to us? Mm -hmm. If I understood it correctly, the founding fathers didn't want a democracy. No, they absolutely did not want a democracy. They're like, oh my gosh, those unwashed masses being able to make a decision that could possibly affect us. Absolutely not. And that was shocking to me when I first found that out um, several years ago and looking at the Federalist Papers and, you know, seeing the debates about how they were going to do that. Um, we've always been, I guess, what they call a representative republic. Um, I think that was the term. And so um, they I don't think they would be surprised at all. I think they would kind of like scold us that we're not, that the powers that be are not doing it um, efficiently enough and it's messy and it's, and it's not elegant and it's, um, it's undignified, but I don't know if they would really be upset that it wasn't a democracy. Um, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I only use the term democracy because the book does, but also because that's such a huge part of American political propaganda is calling ourselves a democracy and until it's politically convenient to bring up the fact that we're actually a democratic republic. Well, we're a democracy in which, what was it? 120 million people didn't vote in 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 14 or something like that. I mean, we have this huge, terrible voting statistics. I mean, it's a weird, we keep expanding the franchise to more and more people. And except for this last election, fewer and fewer people vote as a percentage. It's been really odd. And you have to wonder if that's strategy or not. You know, I'm really struck by uh, the inventiveness of people who want to deny, can we, from my, the point, my point of view is that voting is good and that everybody who is entitled to vote should vote and should be able to vote without impediment. So that's kind of my base position. Now that may not be everybody's base position, but that's what I, I believe. So from my point of view, more voting is better, you know, because the consent of the governed is what legitimizes our government. So 
if you have a system in which less than 50% of people actually vote, how much consent do you have that system? Or if you're putting up barriers, but uh, we are pretty inventive. That's the only thing I can say, you know, in the past we had, uh, you know, literacy tests, poll taxes, off year elections, straight out disenfranchisement, uh, grandfather clauses, uh, all those kinds of things. But today we have uh, voter purges, redistricting, reducing polling places and hours, uh, voter identification laws that get stricter and stricter, uh, all kinds of things. So we've just developed a new kind of set of tools to keep people from voting. It's, it's pretty crazy. The old ones don't work, but the new ones seem to work. It's interesting that you use the term we have been good at doing this. I, I don't think it's a we. I think it's a small group of people that have had this debate over time and they modify their strategy to adapt to the times and they have the resources and the experience in order to do so. Um, that's the problem is that it's not we. It is a small group of people. And um, so the question is, is how do we expand it and contribute our voices to perhaps do something different? Um, well, I, I wanna challenge that a little bit. Uh, so just who, what do you think? Is it we, the people who are actually doing doing this, Jaden? I think, I think mainly the people that are doing the legislative part of Suppressing the vote, yes, that's mainly lawmakers, and especially the Republican Party, who it's proven low turnout equals Republican win. But I also think that people have a very important role to play in speaking out against this. Whites included need to start speaking up because if we have a overwhelming public thinking that this is wrong, we can do something about it. But if we don't have strong voices, we can't. And people usually like to don't speak up when it doesn't affect them. That's what the people do. If it's not me, it's, it's not my problem. That's what they say. And I think it's time for us to say something different about that. I think it's a really interesting point that you said at the end is that a lot of people don't, um, a lot of people, you know, don't speak up unless it affects them. And I wanted to bring up the point that a lot of our still current disenfranchisement and our historical disenfranchisement has focused on some of the people who need it the most. I mean, so do you have, you know, felony, uh, felon disenfranchisement and, and, and prisoner disenfranchisement? Well, it's, they are under very strict systems that are prone to abuse. And one of the main ways to stop that from happening would be to voting in people who would fix it, but they are not allowed to vote. And then when you have felony disenfranchisement and prisoner disenfranchisement, it is then politically uh, good practice to put people who disagree with you into prisons because maybe nowadays you can't disenfranchise an entire race, but you can definitely take steps to put people of that race into prison and that takes away the vote. Uh, so I'm gonna um, push back a little bit on the we, um, on the we issue. Okay. So I took a couple years ago, um, I was involved in this um, civic um, program and we interacted with legislators and it occurred to me that I wondered how many legislators were normal citizens, how many of them were wage earners. So I took a look at the Louisiana legislators. Um, a lot of them are retired and if they're not retired, they are business owners, they are lawyers. So, and the reason why is because it would be very difficult for a wage earner to be able to do the public service with the minimal um, salary or compensation that they get for this. And also to take that kind of time off that they need to be able to go legislate. So is it really we, or is it you know really in the hands of the business class again, as it was in the very beginning? Um, these folks have the means to take the time off to do the service. They also have the financial ability to be able to do that. I don't see someone that's working a minimum wage job or someone that is working um, even just the middle income job um, having the capacity to be able to be a legislator or to mount a campaign to even get elected to be a legislator. So 
I, I still have a hard time believing it's a, a we and not so much a small group of people um, compared to the general population. Um, that's yeah, pretty that's cool. a, um, Go ahead, Jaden. Like, I feel like the Republican Party is working very hard to limit the votes, especially in Georgia, like the new stuff coming up there, not having votes on Sunday, making you have to go into the early voting polling place to put your ballot in when you're voting. People who work minimum wage jobs and who work nine to five jobs and have to pick up kids after work can't do that. They cannot go to the polling place from nine to six and drop their ballot off. And I think that's a way of getting votes. That's what they're doing. And it needs to be brought up by the Supreme Court. It needs to be a thing because nobody, nobody should want to disenfranchise people now, today. They've seen the history. We read the book. And it's something that shouldn't be happening in our country. I agree with, um, Go ahead, Camille. Um, I agree with Vanessa that I don't think it's a we the people thing. I think that um, like I've heard a lot of the excuses that were in the book about fraud, a lot of like the kind of, I guess you could say fear mongering. I've heard that among regular people that I've had conversations with that they're scared of that. But I don't think that those or ideas that they're necessarily coming up with. I think it's being spoon fed to people um, by a small amount of people. And so it's just getting spread and normalized, but I don't think it's necessarily us um, perpetuating it. Okay, so who can do something about this? If you can't say it's we the people who are responsible for this, then who can fix it? You know, so we have a situation here, right? I mean, don't go ahead, Jimmy. Well, I, I, I cautiously disagree with the, with this notion that it's not we. I, I do think it is we. And I think that we have we collectively, meaning the the our you know the the folks who 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 lived before us, who put into place. Uh, you know, laws and rules and that have been perpetuated and or dismissed and then were re-put in. We today have the, you know, there is a segment of the population that is entitled to vote. And so it's that we that continues to perpetuate for what, I mean, we can say a lot of different reasons, but but I have to, I have to believe that the power still, to some extent, has to be us. Um, the consequences are very complex. Uh, the notion to send something, I think Jaden said, to go to the Supreme Court. And I had to smile and think to myself, well, the Supreme Court is appointed by, you know, the, the president, um, if, if the president's allowed to, as in the case, we know that uh, President Obama was not because of politics and elected officials. And so to, to, to get ourselves out of what I'm hearing is a, a consensus concern, I don't see any other way than to do it other than within the realm of vote uh, and elections um, by getting persons that maybe Vanessa are wage earners uh, elected and, and getting uh, overturning and, and having some things occur that we've seen in some states where, you know, who would have thought um, even election day that two senators uh, from Georgia would be Democrat uh, come January. So there, there are ways and there are means within this. That doesn't mean that Georgia is not going to turn around and change laws to prevent that from occurring again. But it's, it's the persistence and the, and the, and the, you know, understanding of how these laws, how these rules manipulate, continue to perpetuate, you know, the concerns that are being expressed here today. That I think is important. Yeah. So it takes me back to my initial question, um, and I think it, it, it ends it compliments your question, Pearson, who is Lickman's audience? So he's bringing up all these things and he wants all these reforms. Who is empowered to do that exactly, right? So I think that the people who are empowered to do that are going to have to step forward definitely with the support of people who may not, who have been marginalized or may not have had a voice but it's definitely a conversation that has to um, be had among the people who have resources and who um, are fully recognized um, as being of value in, in the larger society. I think that that need, I think that has happened, but I think with Stacey Abrams, she's a great example of having this grassroots thing. And I think grassroots will lead to reform. 
but I do think a conversation, a serious soul searching has to be done um, with the folks that have that have been fully participating in this process of, of keeping things the way that they are. I think that I think there has to be some kind of um, reflection. I don't want to use I don't want to have too strong a word for it, but there has to be some really serious reflection among um, folks that have been actively engaged in this process um, over history to, to, to get some change done. With, with the grassroots complementing, I'm not saying the grassroots shouldn't happen, but I'm saying the grassroots needs to be complemented with well, the, I, the folks who benefit from the way things are. Vanessa, I think if, if I can jump in, I think Stacey Abrams is a good example of someone who accepted, as Jim would say, that we the people are responsible and got out and made sure that the people got to the polls and voted. And it took an extraordinary effort, right, to elect those two Democratic senators in a previously Republican state. But it also showed that when people got out and voted, that they could change things, you know, uh, so it's a, it's a model for everybody of, of citizen activism in a way to, if, if we don't, and I'm with Jimmy on this, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, you know, if we don't like the country we have, we need to go out and change it. And if we don't like voter suppression, we need to try to mobilize against it. And so that's, uh, you know, find friends where we can. And, you know, if you can succeed in this, we need to make it so that you can't succeed in this country by suppressing the vote. You know, that that's not a strategy. Is that is a strategy that's time honored in this country, is it not, as we look at what our history? Uh, I just wanted to, you know, kind of state that perhaps the contested we the people, I feel like I feel like there is no I feel like it's an evolving answer. I feel like back in the day, we the people, you know, referred to uh, maybe like white property owners who, um, you know, the founding fathers made the Republic for, like that was the people they had in mind. But, you know, as history has progressed, um, we the people is evolving to include African-Americans. It has evolved to include Hispanics, Latinos. Um, and I think just the knowledge that we have now is power. I think that now we, like, now we know about redistricting. We, we know that minorities in certain districts can have a voice. So I, I feel like, um, just to go back to that discussion that We The People is, has been a, um, just an evolving uh, project. And I feel like the more knowledgeable we are about voter suppression, the more we can fight it. So I feel like there, there is a positive um, responsibility that we can be a part of to contribute to the change that we want to see. Well, one of the reasons why uh, African Americans uh, do have a voice is because of the Voting Rights Act that was passed, right? And what, what that points to is that when the Voting Rights Act was passed, Black registration went from 3 to 5% across the South to over 60%. And from that, based on that, and also the renewal, in uh, particularly in 1982, of the Voting Rights Act, uh, that, held, that said that African Americans were entitled to elect people of their own race or people that they supported, not just to have a voice, it had a vote, it had to be an effective vote. But actually the Voting Rights Act is in danger right now on the Supreme Court, you know, Shelby County versus Holder overturned the section five uh, and the preclearance. So uh, right now, all the states that used to discriminate and against their citizens very clearly uh, are free to do so again. And so I think you're gonna be seeing a lot of that. So I think it's important to realize that victories won in the battle for access to the ballot seem to be fleeting, that there has to be this continual kind of re-energizing re, uh, the movement to allow people to vote because the forces that would like to restrict voting seem to just keep coming. Um, I I find it's fleeting for some more than others. Because ever since um, we eliminated the economic disenfranchisement, I don't believe that um, 
that the right to vote has been threatened for that population again, um, since that was removed um, and you no longer had to be a property owner. So mm -hmm. I, I think white men of all classes have had their suffrage and it's never been fleeting and it's never been in danger of it being overturned um, where other populations are more vulnerable. Um, I, I, I think um, that's, I, I think that's a very real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I, I don't think suffrage is as, as fragile for others. I think, but I think that's the, that I also think that's the point with Pearson's point that your point and Jaden, Jaden's point converge and, and are saying the same thing that to make this better, you, the people in power need to be held accountable and the we, the people that is in, is, in, is all encompassing of all Americans, which there's a really great article by Eric Bonner that points to the fact that from the day slavery ended, from the day it was abolished, Black people saw themselves as the people and as American citizens deserving of 100% full, full citizenship rights from the jump. So when that we, the people that is all encompassing of everyone who is American, those people, th that we needs to hold that other we accountable through those grassroots movements by looking at, because when we boil down the disenfranchisement, the, sing the, the singular theme is inconvenience. It's easy for people not to vote when they make it really inconvenient. It, the times are bad. You don't get off for work. You have to pick up your kids. You have to go way out and you don't have a car there's nothing around you no one will help you understand all this it's written in all this jargon that's all one level of inconvenience after another after another after another that makes people think that this isn't worth my time i don't have time for this i don't have time i don't have energy i don't i don't have the brain power to engage with this so i'm not gonna do it because i don't matter my vote doesn't count anyways that's the effectiveness of inconvenience but when the little we looks at the big we and says, you're wrong and you can't do this and we're not going to be okay with it. And we are going to call you to, we are going to bring you to the carpet. We are going to call you to task. We are going to be very loud and obnoxious until you stop. Then we're all we. Just some, the big we has way more power than the little we, but the little we has way more numbers than the big we. And I think that's where y'all's points are converging. And it's converging in a really amazing and beautiful way that is something that is being explored daily amongst grassroots movements, amongst um, nonpartisan organizations, on campuses and community centers everywhere. We're exploring that, like what does our we look like? And how, does, how, can, how can our we affect their we and make them be accountable to us who they're supposed to work for. Interesting. And I think that that brings up a, a part of it that like voting rights isn't like, so, you know, when people have the right to vote, but all these other restrictions, whether that's restrictions through law, like when, uh, when Native Americans were offered the right to vote, but then it was like, oh, but you have to leave your tribe and all this stuff, um, whether that be by law or that just be through, um, you know, de facto versus de jure, whether that just be through through factors like uh, economics in, in that it's like, oh, well, I have to go and I have to go and pick up my kids. And that happens because, you know, you cannot pay someone to look after your kids so you can go do something or that you not, can't get off of work and you can't afford to miss a day, whether that be because of pay or because you don't have great job security. And so the securing of voting rights is a multifaceted problem in that you have to fix, uh, you have to start to fix at least like the economics. And people who are organizing the uh, Amazon union in Alabama, do you not think that when they, if, you know, if they get that union, hoping that they do, that through the a uh, new union contract and, and the better benefits that they bargained for, they might have more time to worry about politics that isn't immediately affecting them. I think that's, um, that's a great point, Dustin. And I actually had a couple of questions 
about current legislation like the HR1, the For the People Act and the PRO Act that's currently out there. Um, would that help advance some of the things that you talked about, Dustin? I'm not a policy expert. That's why I had the question. Um, uh, what would be the implications of that for the, um, the, for the People Act? Does it go far enough to enfranchise voters? And for the PRO Act, the protecting the right to organize, which is related to Amazon, would that um, help with the economic disparity um, and provide some sort of stability such that people would have the space um, to be able to consider those things as Dustin um, talked about? Yeah, I can't really prophesy about the fate of either of those, except that uh, the Senate is very tough. Uh, but, you know, in some sense, there's a, you know, the House has really laid down the gauntlet to say, look, we want to have this kind of change that makes elections more secure and that gives people the right to organize and that takes back some power. You know, there are other things, though, you know, there's there's uh, Shelby County, there's Citizens United, there are other things uh, that are arrayed against uh, against voting. Uh, I wanted I wanted to mention a couple of uh, I was looking at the Voting Rights Act, which we've been talking about a little bit, uh, you know, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, uh, there was an Operation Eagle Eye. Did you see that in the book? Operation Eagle Eye, which were poll watchers that they put to make sure that fraud would not take off. Uh, Senator James Eastland said this about the Voting Rights Act. Uh, By allowing Blacks to vote, you will unleash a chain reaction which will finally culminate in the establishment of an all-powerful, unchecked, unanswerable, super socialist state. The dark night of despotism will descend like a pall upon this great nation and the rule of tyranny will pervade the land if black people vote, basically. So pretty interesting though, that it's it's socialism apparently that's the big evil and black voting is contributing to socialism. So those are kind of the idea of fraud. We need to get people to the polls to make sure there's no fraud and socialism. Um, by the way, the motor voter bill that we all think about in passed in 1993 makes it easy. They're going back, they're gonna, there's a bill in Congress, I think it would be strengthened as a result of HR1. By the way, George H.W. Bush vetoed that bill when it got to his desk. Uh, do you know why he vetoed it? Fraud, he was afraid it would lead to fraud. So we really see this kind of over and over again. Well, let's, so we got a few minutes left, just really about 15 minutes left. So let's talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was our state election system. Uh, chapter seven focuses on new world, new wars over the vote. And uh, one of the things uh, they point out is the election in Florida, president in 2000. That was won by 537 votes after the Supreme Court intervened to stop counting. Uh, in that election, Florida election officials invalidated 180,000 ballots. So think about that, a presidential election that determined the presidential race decided by 537 votes in an election that where 180,000 ballots were invalidated for one reason or another one in 10 African-American ballots. Uh, now you say, how in the world can that be possible? And well, each of Florida's 67 counties administered its own election, designed ballots, designed its technology, trained its poll workers. They used five distinct different voting technologies and 12 different kinds of machines in the 67 counties made by seven different manufacturers. So, that is a synopsis of the Florida election system. Uh, and by and large, that's a synopsis of every election system in every state in the United States. Uh, so I guess the question that I want to toss out to the group here is, can we afford at this date to maintain an election system at the state level or does the national government need to step in and pass strong legislation. 
interesting enough, um, I've lived in multiple places in the United States and I came to Louisiana. I just remember having conversations with um, folks that were very upset about the Voting Rights Act that required preclearance. They felt that that was an aggressive um, attack on them and that they were being singled out unfairly and that they were um, this is just another example of the snobby areas of the United States underestimating the capacity of the South. Um, so putting that and I'm using that as a context to think that I think something like that would be resisted wholeheartedly. Um, and I, while it might be um, an alternative certainly worthy of looking at, I think I don't see it feasible as, as, as happening, um, but maybe that's just me being pessimistic. I mean, I definitely uh, agree, at least to a certain extent with that argument. I can't stop talking about this book that I've recently read, uh, Freedom Summer by Bruce Watson, because it, it shows like 1964, exactly what you said of uh, people being, you know, specifically Mississippians and their government being so against federal government intervention, but just outsider intervention at all. They didn't like the fact that you had, you know, a, a, a bunch of um, Northern college students coming down. They saw that as an invasion, um, both physically, but also an invasion of like their rights uh, to, to govern their state as they want to. And I think with this, like with with the heightened political tension in the country, that 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 definitely would happen. That that would be some sort of uh, big fight in, in that the 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 southern states are being singled out, or or states of just a certain party are being singled out. Vicky, you were going to say something. Um, I was just going to say this to me is all part of the bigger picture that I think that we are fighting in um, across government entirely of the dichotomy between so much of what or how we operate is national and how we think and how we talk about politics is national, but it really is managed by the state. And these are two things that are more and more pushing against each other. And when you talk about what the we, the people want, they're also, they're usually talking about the federal government helping or making things right, but it's really the states that we have in control. And it's becoming to me a bigger and bigger push between the two. And voting is just all part of that. I think the phenomenon Vanessa and Dustin and Vicky are talking about, I, I call it like, it's the ghost of reconstruction. It's this idea that's not, it's not a strictly Southern idea to be very clear, but it's this idea that after the Civil War, was not an idea, it's what happened. After the Civil War, the federal government came in and decided to tell all these states what they could and could not do. And when they left, there was this resurgence of this, this demand for state-led independence and don't tread on me. And you see it not just when, I, it's not just about black, the, uh, black disenfranchised, we see it with, with um, um, ecological issues and um, mill towns did very similar things when it came to issues of pollution. And it's, 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 it's intentional. And absolutely, if it's like, well, now we're, the states don't get to dictate how we vote, the federal government dictates how we vote, people are going to lose their minds. It's going to be an attack where the communists are coming, or the, the, burn down all the buildings, they're going to come and tear down the White House, I don't know. But that is, that's all part of a much bigger narrative that we're not talking about, uh, which we are talking about tonight, that little we versus the big we and who's benefiting from these these arguments that they're these these theories, not arguments. These these um, what's the word? Conspiracy theories. They're kind of throwing out there that they grasp onto little bits of history to make true without talking about why why it had to exist to begin with. So that's like the ghost of Reconstruction that the federal government's going to swoop in and dismantle everything you love about your home place and try to make it something else and leave it in shambles. And then because of their intervention, they broke it and you are forced to fix it all by yourself. So just keep them at bay as long as possible. Yeah. 
Dr. Cross, was your question when you when you asked? I think you said, should we look to pass strong legislation? Are are you considering HR one as a piece of strong legislation? I am. I mean, it's a it's a very strong piece of legislation. If it were passed, it would completely remake elections in the United States by setting out a bunch of really straightforward ground rules by uh, changing funding for uh, con congressional candidates, by limiting money in politics, by creating. I mean, it's very, very sweeping. I encourage you to take a look at it. Well, I have, and I and I and I would concur. I wanted to be sure we were talking to think about the same thing there. I I, I, I would concur 100% that it's very strong. I also have real concerns, as you alluded to, about the, the Senate being willing to um, embrace it and get 60 votes to, to, to pass it at this point. And my question, I guess, would be to you is, is it important enough or worth it enough to give up the filibuster to, to be able to, to pass this, this piece of legislation? Well, as it turns out, I'm not a fan of the filibuster in the first place. So uh, I think it's unconstitutional roughly because I think, I mean, it's not unconstitutional in the real sense that it, but it does thwart the will of a majority. So I'm, I'm willing to live and die without, uh, you know, without a super majority. There's nothing in the United States constitution about uh, bills get passed if they can get a super majority in the Senate. The Senate is already extraordinarily unrepresentative in terms of the American people, in terms of the electoral college and everything else. So uh, in terms of smaller states with less population. So my concerns about representation in the Senate and, uh, you know, about the filibuster are very minuscule compared to the needs that we have for passing, uh, you know, bills that make sense for the United States as a whole. But that may not be where everyone else is, but that's where I am. You asked what I felt. And that's I did. I, I, I specifically asked your opinion. I, I value your opinion. Thank you. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about um, one of the things that's interesting about districting and um, well let's talk about the future because we're coming to the end of our we're coming to the end of our uh, time and I'm, I'm thinking I'd like to end this on a hopeful note if we could you know uh, and that is uh, does anyone, did anyone take away anything from this book that makes them think, you know, it's going to be okay? Or did it make you want to go in your closet and slash your wrists or something? I don't know. I think this, this does give me a hope that I, that I kind of already had in that, even though um, voting rights and like, you know, rights and, and equality and, and the morality of, of the country is, is not a, a linear path it it seems to mostly have a trend you know towards towards good and towards just and that hopefully someday we get there and hopefully it's soon I, i'd say I I oh go ahead camille um i came out like knowing more about voting than i ever did before and i'm definitely gonna um, recommend this book to everyone. And I think that we should just continue to empower people through education. People just need to be educated about the past and what their rights are and what they can do in the future. And I think that this book is awesome for that. I I finished it feeling more empowered and feeling like, you know, there is hope. Excellent. I, I was just going to say that I, I left with some hope. I, I think that I be, was very depressed reading and re, being reminded of the history and, and, you know, but, but to end with a series of very specific recommendations and or opportunities that we, that we can work towards and try to uh, enact to, to provide greater uh, opportunity for, for true voting, I think is, you know, or full voting is, is, is something good. You know, the, the motor voter registration, the same day registration, anti-gerrymandering requirements, and he, and he lists, you know, this, this, this whole litany of, of, of actions that are all, by the way, just about all included in HR1, but that, that we can work for and strive for. There's, there's a path forward, I guess, is what leaves me opportun you know, optimistic. Uh, the, well, the book certainly ends on a hopeful note. And I think, you know, the main takeaway is 
if you are a citizen of the United States, no matter what your background is, you have the uh, privilege of participating in suffrage and you are entitled to voting and you are entitled to getting your voice out there. So if there's anything to really take away from that, it's a never let anyone take that right away from you and to always fight uh, for representation, no matter who you are, or where you come from. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, the next, I think it's the next book in your series, Bending Towards Justice. Is that what it is? Um, Which one? Let me Which double one are you doing? Which one Vanguard. are you doing? In? It's Vanguard. Vanguard. Oh, Vanguard. Vanguard. Yeah. Are you reading Bending Towards Justice later on? Yes. The, uh, yeah. The, uh, last one. Yeah. Yes. The, so in terms of optimism, if you think about it, and someone said this, is that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, which I think Obama said uh, so, or uh, I think Martin Luther King said it originally, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's what I choose to think. I mean, voting has expanded. More and more people are able to vote. We, we realize these attacks on votes are happening. People are pushing back. Uh, you know, it just may be longer than, uh, you know, a few years. It's not like you're going to snap your fingers and fix it. This is something that it's a reason to stay involved as citizens, you know, and it's it's a fight worth fighting, frankly, in my view. And so that that gives me hope, I think. So this is, you got, it's 8.01 and before, I just wanna let everyone know, I've just added a um, an anonymous survey in the chat box that is necessary per the agreements with our funding agency um, for evaluation purposes. So I please, 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 everyone who participated, please take time to fill out this survey and send it and send it uh, and submit it. Don't send it to us, just hit the submit button. Um, this has been amazing. You guys are amazing. I am not trying to quickly end the conversation. I did want to say that before I forgot as we were approaching eight o'clock. So if anyone still want, wants to continue to talk, you know, the floor is yours, but this has been amazing. You guys have been amazing. I'm very glad everyone has enjoyed the book and definitely encourage your friends and family to read this. This is not, um, this is not just strictly a personal thing. This is something, voting is an act we do that affects everybody around us, even not just within our, our immediate neighborhood, but literally the nation over. And that's something important to remember. It is a responsibility, but it is a powerful and um, should be an exciting responsibility that every citizen engages with. So definitely encourage people to pick up this book and discuss. You guys now all can lead book discussions on this if you like. Um, you guys have tools, you've read it, you, you have internalized it and you guys can definitely go forth and encourage all kinds of conversations and who knows you know this might be a great resource students on the call for like papers and things of that nature you know just a thought um so i'm very excited and i just wanted to say thanks again for everyone participating and it, feel free to continue to talk <laughs> Thanks, Shailen. Thanks for hosting. And I want to, by the way, compliment the students who joined us on this uh, on this uh, conversation. You all, you know, did really well. I thought it was great. Appreciate you being here. And thanks for taking this book seriously. <laughs>